And as I um, told you uh, right uh, before the lunch break, now we are going to speak about uh, technologies and uh, risks. Uh, Victor Dostov uh, will moderate this uh, uh, section. I mean that uh, he is uh, skillful and knowledgeable uh, in, uh, in money um, and uh, in our uh, digitalization project. Uh, he has uh, uh, the identification uh, group. So, Victor, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much uh, for your kind words about myself. Первый первый Thank you, Vitor, and good afternoon. Hi again. Um, it's not. It's always difficult to be the first speaker after lunch, particularly when you're talking about risks. Not really one of the things for the, the most exciting uh, topics. Definitely an important one. So I'll try to keep it short and uh, to provide a little bit of framework for the presentation of the other colleagues during this session who will go then more specifically into some of the security risks and other aspects of the risk mitigation and management. Uh, so what's the framework a little bit to look into risks? I think the first important thing to consider in terms of activities is the risk assessment. So really trying to uh, identify and to quantify the specific risks of mobile money business and putting them in the context of the risks for the financial sector. Um, something that is particularly challenging with the new products and in general when we talk about technology and innovation is to be accurate in uh, understanding and assessing the likelihood of the impact of a new product or a new solution. And that's also why uh, regulators tend to be conservative at the beginning because regulators have often a very low risk appetite and it takes them a while to understand new products. Um, I don't say it's their responsibility uniquely to go through these steps. I think the private sector plays a fundamental role in uh, uh, making the regulator aware of uh, the features of the new services and products, the way risks intend to be mitigated, and uh, to provide examples, uh, engaging with the regulators at the very early stage when they develop uh, new innovations for markets. So I think uh, it's important when there is a, a technological innovation, or innovation in general, uh, to be available from both sides to go through a curve of mutual learning where the regulator leaves some space to the private sector to test its product, but definitely the private sector doesn't take risks that are not um, proper for the type of people, markets and products that are offered. And this is what helps really the regulator, but also the, the providers to identify the proper controls and uh, to, un to check, to test their effectiveness. Um, often these are things that are not fully understood and designed at the beginning and needs uh, to be um, tested, designed, retested, redesigned until uh, we are sure that uh, the approach is the right one. Um, I think 
several countries with mobile money have decided to go this way and we called it a test and learn approach where under the overview of the uh, central banks um, some of the providers were able to launch their products and uh, gradually to, to scale uh, making some correction uh, when necessary. And then the other key activity is reporting the most significant risks um, and this is fundamental that significant risks are escalated internally by the private sector providers to uh, the right control, uh, pe people who are in charge of controls, and uh, also escalated to the, um, the regulators when it's the case. In, the, in some cases these procedures are very straightforward, for example in the case of AML CFT, where there are countries where there is a financial intelligence unit that needs to receive reports about any um, the critical risk in terms of financial integrity. So, based on this framework, I, the, other, the other way I wanted to frame the discussion, help to frame the discussion is to think about risks from a subjective point of view for each of the participants in the ecosystem. Uh, so each stakeholder has a different um, look at risks. And sometimes it's very difficult for, uh, um, in a dialogue between these players to understand uh, where some uh, um, concerns are coming from and often is because we don't understand each other uh, what are the risks that we are considering. So for example clearly for a regulator stability, integrity, consumer protection as it was mentioned before but now also financial exclusion it's a big risk and it's a big concern particularly now that is more clear to the regulatory community that the objectives of stability in credit, in integrity inclusion and consumer protection are mutually reinforceable if we have more inclusive financial sector there is much less risk that um, people are left into the informal financial sector, into the informal economy, which definitely has problems for consumer protection, for financial integrity. If we have a bigger base of uh, people saving their money into a mobile wallet, uh, slow um, value deposits, we will have more stability. So this is something where we find more and more agreement progressively in the regulatory community, and mobile money definitely contributes to this. And then the other risk for the regulators is conflicts of regulations, uh, particularly when we talk about digital financial services, there is from some central banks the fear of entering conflict with the telecommunication regulators. And that's also where we need to be aware of the possible solutions, which is for example to uh, have a regulation that uh, provide for the creation of specific uh, digital financial services provider, whether they're called uh, payments, mobile payments provider their mobile money providers, e-money providers, which are pretty much the same, but, but that means that there is a specific financial institution that can be established by an MNO, a mobile network operator, a third party, or, or uh, others to provide these services, but the regulator, the financial sector regulators keeps full control of this institution. From the point of view of the provider, of course, talking about mobile money, the first concern is about the protection of customer fund. And this happens, uh, we will see later, uh, with a specific and very successful uh, way that has been tested now in almost all the markets where mobile money exists, which is the creation of uh, uh, escrow account where the, pooled, the funds of the customer are pulled together and there is a way to mitigate uh, the, the credit risk and also the to mitigate uh, the risk of, uh, um, in case of bankruptcy from the provider side. The, there is, the, for the provider, the big risk of the frauds from uh, employees, from the staff, from the agents. Um, the fact that some agents are fake agents and not the real agents, it's very difficult to monitor, ch challenging to monitor when you have 100,000 agents, all the agents are behaving in the right way, but it's also where there are uh, structures that are put in place for delegating controls to uh, 
agents aggregators so that there are intermediate steps for the management of the agents where uh, the, the providers use these micro agents and then the micro agents are supervising the single agents. The risk of non-compliance of course is enormous because if uh, uh, the providers don't understand regulation they are not compliant they, they risk penalties but they risk also to uh, be revoked their license. And then uh, the risks for the agents, the, fund of the counterfeit money, um, the transactions that can go wrong, uh, threat and security concerns because they need to manage liquidity, big amounts sometimes in the rural areas so criminals of course are sick for their, the, their money, um, and then the liquidity, the liquidity management. Um, for the customers, I think the most important ones are around uh, their, their data and their personal sensitive information. Identity theft, um, the fact that transactions can go wrong and they don't know where to go to find redress, um, the fact that they can make a mistake and send the money to a different account, um, that the service goes down and they cannot transact, or that they, uh, that they lose their money that is in, already in the system. And then for the bank that is partnering with the mobile money providers, of course, also there is a risk. There is a risk of reputation, uh, managing such a big amount of money in their deposits. And that there is a, a risk of having a concentration of funds. And that's also why some regulators ask uh, mobile money providers to partner with different banks so that the uh, pooled accounts are the custodian banks for those pooled accounts are different and uh, the risk is diversified. Quickly, areas of, cons of, uh, of risk that are relevant are definitely so around where the money of the customer is sitting and where these deposits stay, um, anti-money laundering and combating financing terrorism regulation. Uh, it's fundamental to find a good balance there because too much strict regulation on AMLCFT can really be detrimental for financial inclusion, but at the same time we need to guarantee that the system is not abused. So um, that's why we say we need a proportional approach. Uh, reliable distribution network agents behaving according to their contracts with the providers. Reliable channels. So the fact that the IT infrastructure is, uh, can be used and uh, can support the volume of the transactions. Uh, from the point of view of the security, the effective protection of customer data, again and again, for me, it's a fundamental point. I know of many opportunities now also to use customer data to improve financial inclusion. I think uh, this is very important is uh, it's incredible that now we can use for example all this information that we have on customers to create data scoring and to, 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 to credit scoring and but we always need to be aware that this this is customer information it's sensitive and customers must must, must authorize for the use of their information um, the fair treatment of customers, I think it's key to have clear and timely disclosure of the price and terms of the, of the products and uh, the services. Um, making sure that customers understand that they can have redress uh, in case something goes wrong. And finally, uh, again, the protection of data and sensitive information from the point of view of the contractual side. I uh, will skip this one. I wanted to go on uh, so two examples when we go more in the de detail about risk mitigation. And one is how to protect the funds of the customers in, uh, in these uh, type of business models. Uh, so normally what, what happens is that these are prepaid models. Agents um, but I, I will try to be very simplistic. Agents buy some credit and convert their cash into this electronic credit. And then agents resell this electronic credit to the customers. Um, this is another reason why 
mobile network operators have been successful because this is a model that they already have implemented when they have done this uh, for airtime. And this is a model that customers already know. And we go back to your question this morning of the difference about a bank and a telco uh, doing this work. A big difference is that a customer has been already part of this model for many years simply using their airtime, the money that they put in their phone to call their clients. It's very similar. They go to an agent they give uh, some money, they receive the equivalent in electronic value that they can use for the transfers. So the familiarity with this model and the familiarity with the operators creates trust in the system. So when the, where all this money is sitting is not sitting in a mobile money provider account. It's sitting in a commercial bank. It's sitting in a fully prudentially regulated bank account. So the same controls that apply to uh, all other bank accounts will apply to those accounts. And now there is more and more research also on the area of uh, um, the um, insurance for these accounts to make sure that these accounts where all the money of millions of people are pooled are protected. Uh, through the, 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 the banking insurance system. Kenya is one of the countries that is doing the research, but also many others. And then there are uh, requirements to ring fence these accounts, so that, for example, if the mobile money providers goes down, the creditors of the mobile money service are protected and can get their money back. Um, so there are ways that have been already tested. And uh, the other area that is fundamental is on AML CFT. And that's really where there are so many peculiarities of mobile money based on the opportunities that technology is offering to us. So the typical controls to manage the risks for AML CFT are the fact that there are maximum balance limits, transactional limits, whether on value and volume, with different uh, daily, monthly, or yearly limits. The fact that the systems are monitored in real time and there are um, the opportunities through the softwares that the mobile money providers are using to identify suspicion transactions and then to flag them to the right authorities. Uh, verification of customers uh, based on the blacklists provided by the uh, regulators and uh, also uh, all the verifications are necessary to verify the transaction of the political exposed uh, people. And finally, the fact that all the transactions are going through mobile, it's the biggest guarantee per se. Uh, mobile means uh, a GPS monitoring, means that we know where a transaction was made, who made the transaction, because we, this person has identified himself with a PIN twice, the first time to access his mobile device, the second time to access the transactionality of the wallet. So we really know that there is one person with a PIN doing the transaction in that point at that time, and we can track this over time. So this is new, this is need to be understood by providers and by, and by regulators, but there are enormous opportunities for risk management that uh, operators and regulators are already testing. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for a wonderful presentation, and uh, I think that since the topic of the presenters cross over, we'll have other questions in the end of our panel, and we'll ask them all together. Uh, the classification of risks is very interesting, and we see that this uh, one-dimensional um, measurement of risks. On the one hand, uh, we have a multidimensional space, but at the same time, uh, we see certain um, risks which uh, could be also considered in the um, unilateral dimension. Uh, now we'll have, uh, now we'll have uh, Joseph's dual presentation. Прокомментировали то, что говорил Симон, и поговорили также о рисках. Okay. First of all, I will introduce the company, but just to say that as we've come through the day, we've covered a lot of themes where all of 
your guests today are probably pretty much in agreement. Many of us have traveled the same path, so I'll try not to repeat those points. If we roll on to the next slide, our perspective is that we understand the technology. We've been doing networks for 120 odd years now, and we understand how this works, not just as systems, but as a business. We, aside from anything else, actually manage the subscriptions of roughly one billion of the world's six billion subscribers. So we are a sort of meta operator as well. In the mobile money space, though, because of the nature of the business, we have explored this for about five years now, and we've decided that our role is to enable, not to operate on the front line, that's appropriately for other parties, but to help make it happen. And not just in one operator for one case with one bank, for example, but to provide platforms which enable interoperability. If this is going to work as a mass service, and one of the questions I've already had today is, why aren't there more really massive m-commerce and banking services out there? Then we need the different approaches to work together. Different institutions, different consumer groups to be able to use a common system. But again, we believe the telecoms world is the right place from which to take that, because it's a standards-driven world anyway. That's what's made it so successful. If we look at GSMA in particular, the magic of GSM is that what was once a rather obscure your telecom standard became universal simply because everybody could work with everybody else. And other perfectly valid technical approaches like CDMA died in the process. So this is not a technology business in the end. It's about people and how they communicate with each other. If we roll on. Very good. In terms of the market here, we each have our own vision, we also share resources, but here are some numbers that we see as significant. Over the next three to four years, we see that Russia's base of, shall we say, smart, capable phones will probably reach around the 100 million. Now that sounds very optimistic given current levels maybe, but we're going to see a new wave now with super low cost smartphones. We're not talking the 25 to 40,000 ruble Apple, that's one approach for one segment. We're talking $50 and less equivalent price for a smartphone capable of whatever services you need. We see a, an enormous growth in mobile data, and while much of that growth is driven by one channel, video viewing of one sort or another, more and more other services will also travel in this way. And of course we see an enormous base of subscriptions. Now an important point, we do consumer research in Russia every two years, so we're well aware that despite the enormous subscription base, there is also a persistent percentage of the population which does not have a mobile subscription of its own, and in many cases have no intention of ever having such a thing. This may be as high as 12%, depending on where you look. However, almost all of those people still have access to a mobile subscription, which is one reason that they can do this. It may be somebody in the family or somebody in a small settlement, somebody at work, but they actually do have the ability to access service. And the question I pose at the end of the table is where does this take us with mobile financial services? Let's roll on. Because as already discussed, so I'm not going to go back on this, it's not just a phone, this device. It's so many more things already for users. It is a, a tool for life. And in countries all around the world, including here, people say this in different ways, but it has become an essential element in communication, in settlement of small money transactions already, even without formal systems and applications. It has overtaken DVD players. The only device in the world which competes now is the passive television. But that's not a tool for anything. That's a different medium. So in terms of an active piece of electronic kit, We've already got it. We've got an answer which has established itself. And this perhaps was a little bit accidental. Nobody saw this coming. It's a bit like projections about computers. But again, the mobile phone has left notebooks and desktops far behind long ago. And we don't see any retreat happening there. And again, this was partly driven by the human role it plays. It's a simple connector. It doesn't take up too much space. It's not difficult to look after. Maybe easy enough to break, but even then, 
and it is driven by trusted standards. You try to place your call, you reasonably rely that it will get through and persist, and that your communication is fairly secure. The algorithms, of course, can be broken, but the technology in an ordinary GSM 3G LTE phone is actually pretty secure in itself, a whole lot secure than many other technologies we trust. If we roll on. So, our concept is what we call Bank 3.0. Again, not to go over already covered territory, we see a shift and it's happening almost everywhere in the world. Different countries started at different places on this spectrum, but the era of trotting, as the Americans often say, round the corner to the high street bank, that's already history in much of the world. And again, there's no going back. Even here, we've seen the mass networks like Sparabank shrink to nice modern super branches with more and more of the tiny satellite offices in the yard below the apartment closing in the process. But do people have less access as a result? In general, no, because there have been tools to replace that, including the online tool on the phone. So there hasn't been an outcry because people in fact have access to what they need, to the, to the really essential services. So now people are doing it on a device, on a computer if not at home, in something like a public library or civic office. And you still need the other touch points but you need them less often. And we see a time when you won't need them at all, because we touch a little bit more on security, but again, it's important to understand just how much security your mobile device brings you. Aside from the entry point pin that almost all devices have, you can set a secondary pin on the SIM card to further protect it. You can have fingerprint scanner, as is now built into some devices. You can do retinal scan of the eye, which in some ways is even more secure. You can scan barcodes of documents to validate address data. Data. A lot of the things that we currently do face to face in the know your customer process can in fact eventually migrate to the mobile without any great loss of security. You can have a video interview with a call center agent who can check your biometric data and validate that you are who you are. And it's a lot more secure than anything your ATM or even until recently your Swiss bank vault could do. And you're already carrying the device that can do that. So we don't see that there's any insurmountable problem there. But it is a matter of trusting in those things, and it's a matter often of various different regulators of different spheres all trusting together in those things. But being who we are, we believe in this. We saw this coming a long time ago, and we believe that this is the end game. But everybody has to stay engaged, especially the device makers, because a lot of it relies on that interface. If we roll on, this cannot be read maybe in full detail on these screens, but what we have here is a little pyramid breaking down this famous 2.5 billion we've been touching on. I'm not going to dwell on it now, only to say that this mobile economic model is much more than banking. That's a critical point for people like ourselves. Banking is one of the things people do in life, but it's basically a way of exchanging. But there are others as well, and the same mechanisms, and already implemented to some degree in different places, can handle transport ticketing, including airline, can handle entertainment records of one sort or another, can handle information exchange with state authorities. It's all already on board. And if we go to the next slide, again, it's just to illustrate the complexity, you don't need to read all the detail, but here is a partial architecture of some of the mobile financial services already implemented to some extent somewhere in the world. And this will grow. There is, in fact, in the end, almost nothing that is currently done in a transactional way that can't be done through this channel. And the technology is the enabler for this, but it doesn't have to be only this way. Most of these things can still be done in parallel tracks. And that's, I think, something very important. Some parts of the market will not follow. And compelling people, insisting you may only do this, for example, through a mobile, that doesn't work. That will generate workarounds. People inevitably will figure out how to do that without going through the device then. The same will happen if they feel that they're being observed too much. We, in our regular consumer surveys, ask people how they feel about operators and mobile marketing companies and banks using their personal data. 
and universally throughout the world, a little bit stronger than average in Russia, but it's a universal. People don't like it, even when they know, and still less if they suspect it might be happening without. So here is another very human factor. Because you can place, for example, a transactional limit. The people are perfectly capable of finding a way to get an anonymous phone or borrow somebody else's phone and work their way round. In a way, this has to be sold to the, the marketplace, that this is how it works. If we roll on, because this is actually one of our key messages, just as with mobile voice calling or SMS, best of all, an entirely accidental service, which for most of the last 20 years was the biggest selling telecom service on earth, users find their own way to use a service. You make available the facilities, they'll persuade each other to take it up. And this thing works in networks of friends and families. Somebody does it with somebody else, and after a while, everybody's doing it. And again, in our research in Russia, officially, we have a single-digit percentage of mobile money interchange. But in reality, more than half the population has, at some point or other, settled a small debt by transferring airtime, by giving somebody else a couple of hundred rubles to repay a bus fare or a business lunch or whatever. The mechanism's already understood. Now we need to make it robust, because that's not good, of course. It's not good from the state perspective, and it's not safe from the consumer perspective. Say you send the money to the wrong digit, you can't get it back. Nor can it be monitored for tax, compliance, and anti-terrorism purposes. So we need to persuade people that they need to use the full potential of these things. And we see that given all of this, the growth potential here is phenomenal. And Russia has one or two uniquely interesting characteristics. It is the third largest money transfer market in the world. And this market is currently very dispersed and not, shall we say, it's uneven. Some transactions are really good value. The foreign exchange differentials offered to the market here are among the best in the world. Really, really tight. A lot of people coming from Western Europe don't believe how efficient foreign exchange is. And some money transfer is also very good. And some is outrageously expensive if you have the bad luck to be in a less well-connected part of the former USSR, for example, you pay a pretty awful percentage in transaction cost. And since the handling cost in a telecom environment is fairly trivial, there's money to share between all parties and still offer the end consumer really good value for that transaction. Let's roll on. Now, as I said earlier, one of the questions that keeps coming back, and you've seen more up-to-date statistics slightly than these ones um, from some of our colleagues who were closer to the research, is why isn't there then more of this? How come mobile money isn't everywhere? Why are there only now 20 installations of more than a million in the world? And this is a valid question, but it's back to this human factor. The ordinary user hasn't yet fully accepted that this is a life financial tool. It's used for small things mostly for now. This will change as well with further technological developments. It's already possible to have a SIM card which has what's called near field communications NFC that you can touch for example to a metro post but it's not widespread. You can also attach such a thing as a small plastic tag to the back of your phone or anything else. But these technologies are still rolling out and haven't reached all areas. There are also some process and regulatory restrictions. In Russia, for example, a lot of small businesses do accept some payments to personal cards or phone accounts, but this is not proper fiscal transaction handling here. It is not really legitimate. If we can find a way to enable that and track it, we open up an entire new world. And in a market where there are huge corporations and a lot of individual entrepreneurs, but a lack of middle-sized companies, this could be a phenomenal economic enabler, allowing people in remoter parts, for example, to work for people in other areas and settle up indirectly over the phone. Let's roll on past this. This part is not translated, my apologies for that, but here are some outputs from our consumer survey. Why do people see the potential? But we'll also come to where they see the barriers. And you can see it's very human things. It's about speed. People are not patient. If they want to settle something, especially something small, they want to do it now. So the ability to do it from anywhere without regard to the environment. You're on a metro, you're on a lake somewhere, you're fishing out in the forest, uh, out in the lake in the forest, whatever it is. 
these simple things work. And you notice that security doesn't come in so close to the top. That's partly because with the mobile, to some extent, people are already trusting it with information. Personal photographs, for example. Maybe, as recent issues with Hollywood stars have shown, sometimes there are further improvements to be made in security. Nonetheless, there's a certain trust in their phone and the operator already. Unfortunately, in Russia, more than in conventional banking, where because of past crises and so on, consumer confidence in the mainstream commercial banks, other than the pillar banks, is, is among the lowest in the world. And here, the mobile can actually enhance the overall ecosystem feel a little bit. And you'll notice that at the very bottom, you've operational things like limits on transactions. These don't trouble ordinary users that much because they know how to manage, how to aggregate and move money, for example, so that they fit inside the rules. Let's roll on to some of the barriers because it's important to understand what it is we still have to overcome as well. Uh, sorry, let's come back here. <laughs> I notice we've... Okay. Uh, yeah, that slide has slipped on this one. But okay. Uh, can we go back? Sorry. Natasha, can we go back two slides, please? Yes, here. Th these are the reasons why not, and unfortunately this one has not coordinated on this side, but never mind. You can see that, to counter the statement I just made, the biggest issue with those who have concerns is at the same time security. And that's out there because it's, in a way, it's public information. The next one is also very interesting, though, because the biggest risk with mobile commerce isn't inherent security. That's a misperception, but the next one is very real. It's losing physical control. You lose your device or your SIM card because you've got several and you're changing them from time to time. Then you have created a very real risk and there's still work to be done to improve controls on that. It is doable. Most countries already have equipment registers where you can turn off a stolen phone, for example, very quickly. It is very feasible. But this, you know, this one can be better done. And SIM cards do remain a risk at this time. But again, SIM cards will soon disappear into a soft SIM, a programmable device. And I think we will overcome this issue. And most of the other issues you can see are secondary and down the bottom. And some of them are market dependent, like it is expensive. That depends entirely on how the offering is made. OK, now let's roll to that three block slide. We'll skip this one. So, again, this was touched on earlier. This is something we've also come to understand very well. There are two easy models to begin with. There's the bank-led model and there's the MNO-led model. Both of these have been done in many markets. But more and more we see that each of these has natural limits. And the best model takes both of these but also enables a wider interface of agents, representatives, another tier of contact between consumers and small businesses and the system that actually operates in the background. And if we now roll to the next slide, please. Okay, let's, let's come past this. This is background. Um, one of the things we did as a result of this, uh, one more slide, please, in addition, is, yes, in Peru, it's a first in the world, this one, working with the regulator and the banks, we actually created a single national platform which doesn't force any particular bank to do anything in a particular way, but allows each bank to offer its services its way, but on a common platform so that interoperability is assured from the beginning, and if people trust in the mechanism in the country, if you like, as a whole in the banking industry, then they can use any of the banks comfortably and they can work between banks. It was a long discussion. We went into a lot of issues here. In particular, we spent an enormous amount of time with the regulator because the, uh, but in fact, the two regulators, because the operator regulator needed to understand that operators would be in a good position if they activated this, and the banking regulator needed to be confident that the banks weren't doing anything risky, exposing each other's data to each other, for example, which you cannot do in the banking world. But in the end, this is now rolling out. We'll see how it goes with the consumer side. That's the next stage. But this is one way forward for markets, especially where the demand is high enough to justify some upfront investment. If we roll on here, wrapping up now, here we see just two concluding slides from our global portfolio on this. First of all, we see a cycle here of putting out a simple offering like a, the, the active wallet concept, just a way of storing value in some form that people can use, capturing increasing shares of ordinary little activities 
ticketing might be the next thing after pure money, for example, and then small transactions, services first, later actual physical goods, then offering other financial products, access to state payments, for example, or as touched on earlier, insurance, and finally achieving a full market capacity. So on the last slide, I've just pulled together the conclusions from this. We don't need to read through them all. If we... Last one, in addition to it. Uh, okay, they're not showing up. Then let's wrap up with that point. That for us, as the leading supplier of the technology in this industry, we ah, this is more like it. We believe very strongly that mobile is what will drive this forward. Digital financial services is broader than mobile. That's also important, not to forget. But we believe that mobile is actually the, the, the bit that was missing before. On screen, for example, financial isn't at all new. We also believe that this will eat into many other markets, adding value and still leaving room. There's no reason why existing ticket vendors and banks cannot play. They have a lot of good, valid knowledge. There will be a need to evolve new business models, but there's enough in this. The efficiency is such that there's enough for everybody to take a small share and still save the end user money. And last couple of points here then. We, we will have an interaction with the other things like social networks. This is one way of building trust, that people will see each other using it. And let's close one more. Yes, so I actually close with the trust point that's come up on one, not on the other, which is that at the end we come back to the point that the key here is building ordinary users' trust by not being too ambitious, by not trying to oversell, by not telling them falsehoods basically that this is 100% secure, neither is using an ATM or even walking into a bank branch, but that this is an improvement and enhancement gives them more access and that those they know are also in this space. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. The key thing that I heard uh, was that uh, there is a, let's say, brand new level of integration which we didn't even think about, uh, and that's very interesting. Uh, well, uh, I'm supposed to be the next uh, speaker, but I would like uh, to speak last in uh, this uh, section and now give uh, uh, the floor uh, to Mr. Uh, 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 Tishakov, who is uh, the, the chairman of the National Payment Card uh, System. Uh, well, um, you know that uh, we still don't have, let's say, a National Payment System or National Cards, so uh, we uh, have the task uh, to build a brand new uh, payment system from scratch, from with zero legacy. Хочу поблагодарить вас за то, что меня пригласили принять участие в этом семинаре и внести даже не знаю, как это назвать, в общем-то, разъяснение, наверное, по поводу деятельности которое она займет, когда это все состоится. Виктор здесь тоже сделал несколько небольших таких ошибок, не in uh, 2014, but in 2015, because we are already exhausted, but we shall not manage to run uh, this system by the end of this year. Изменения в законодательстве, они просто беспрецедентно у нас произошли, это действительно шанс для создания в России нечто такого, что у нас невозможно было создать, и мы надеемся, мы технологии платежных систем, это все-таки было не очень возможно, но это сделано, в отличие от прошлых лет, когда просто надо было такого, что не было, сначала запуск 
записи в первую uh, систему электронных денег в России. Uh, we, это know, система Виктор, Пэкэш, since, uh, и с того момента uh, прошло uh, уже 15 лет. И электронные деньги вместо того, что стать ведущим каким-то платежным инструментом и зайти в нашу бизнес, Денежные средства, он прослеживается, но электронные денежные средства более безопасны и дешевле в рамках проекта НСПК не знаю, как это сказать, чиповых карт, которые сегодня реализованы в рамках международных платежных систем Visa, Visa и других И эти недостатки мы в своей карте, которую создадим, устраним. Мы планируем банковскую карту What we plan to Второе, что мы планируем, это изменение обновление повышения может быть карт презент кроме всего прочего набирает модель эмуляции приложения карты Токенизация. Токенизация – это э, подмена no, реквизитов no, настоящей uh, банковской uh, карты uh, некими uh, суррогатами, uh, которые uh, имеют ограниченное временное uh, жизни и Такие вещи мы тоже собираемся о мобильных платежах, но это всем понятно, что телефон сегодня стал очень инструментом, изучали этот процесс глубоко, досконально в различных аспектах. Вот 
Очень, очень жалко, что зажимают эти платежи сегодня с точки зрения законодательства. Well, it's Хотя it's большой разница с точки зрения Мани электронных денег, либо бумажных денег, честно говоря, не вижу. Но в своих инструментах мы предусмотрим возможность электронных денег. Мы также включим возможность To, to, to an e-wallet, e or maybe we shall uh, ensure the interoperability uh, with uh, uh, e-money uh, providers. We are really on the edge of uh, uh, up-to-date uh, technologies, so uh, we can closely monitor uh, the market, uh, and uh, uh, the regulatory rules uh, that uh, we uh, develop uh, right now will not be uh, fixed uh, 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 for Forever, and uh, uh, we will always remain open for uh, your proposals and uh, comment because our aim is uh, to promote uh, cashless uh, payments uh, with uh, high uh, security and reliability. If you have any questions, you're welcome. It's not a question, it's rather a remark. Поднимался вопрос о том, что у НСПК есть уникальная возможность very, uh, создать стандарт не только национальных платежных карт, но и национальный стандарт мобильных и более широкого uh, смысла цифровых uh, финансов. И я очень рад, что вы об этом сказали в своем выступлении. Это уникальная абсолютно возможность, которой нужно воспользоваться на все сто процентов. Когда действительно у нас появится, ну, как минимум, устойчивый технологический права и база для того, чтобы развивать полный мобильный сектор. Спасибо большое. Мы хотим следующий номер. For the development of e-money and e-payments, we all market members, and we all see what is a huge variety of solutions available on the market. Definitely, each of such solutions has pluses and minuses. Они, наверное, вряд ли будут способны, если стандартизация не произойдет хотя бы на уровне страны. Наша цель задача выбрать правильно, и поэтому в рамках НСПК будет создан совет участников НСПК, совет РНС, который, в общем-то, позволит с привлечением специалистов выбрать правильное решение. Спасибо. Олег, большое спасибо. Отличный доклад. Спасибо большое, Олег. Ну, я надеюсь, что у нас будет шанс позадавать вопросы. Мы прекрасно поговорим. Мы говорили про платежи, переводы, риски, связанные с ними. А сейчас мы будем обсуждать еще один кусочек финансового рынка, очень важный кусочек с точки зрения классической финансовой доступности. Это рынок, связанный с кредитами, займами, прочими инструментами. Я передаю слово Евгению Семеновичу Берштаму, представитель директоров ADEO Financial Tribune, одному, видимо, из крупнейших специалистов по микрокредитованию и микрофинансированию в России. Добрый день. Компани, и мы будем в состав группы Адела входят не только микрофинансовые организации, но и коллекторская и с точки зрения тематики сегодняшнего заседания, где клиент все-таки построен не в основном организации бизнеса и другого финансового модели, а в основном технологического продвижения технологического оснащения в основном компания коллектинга Sequoia Credit материалов о ней нет, так как Михаил меня попросил, Михаил Мута, я еду попросил его и микрофинансирую. Но два слова не сказать нельзя по одной простой причине. Компания Sequoia не запущена в промышленную платформу там связана и IP, связана и электронная связь, связана и электронная связь, связана и электронная связь, связана и электронная связь, связана и 
Это была kind of project. Again, I would say no. That was that was very hard work. Instead of a year and a half, we had to work on it for three years. And today, we can say that in August, finally, we launched the product. And today, all the financial sector Russia, and we work with 32 banks as collectors. And all these banks are now equipped with our technology. But that is a different discussion. And in November, we are going to have a special separate meeting for Adele and her money. And another technological explosion is in the sphere of her money. But since I'm not going to speak about that, I just mention it, and that's it. Because we're testing it. But I'll just tell you that all the business of home money has no analogs in the country because it does not have either branches or subsidiaries or floors. And the way the transactions are carried out, that is something unique. And the way we bring our loan products to our customers, that works at homes. And the technologies really play a great role. The home money companies are started the tender, and MTS are one of the tender, and MTS provides us with smartphones, and the business of the company home money, we have 110 agents, and they are all equipped with smartphones, and all the business will be equipped with new smartphones. I have an old telephone, I'm rather conservative. And that is going to be a technological explosion, and I'm not uh, trying to be modest about that. No one has that in Russia. Provident Financial has that, no international personal finance has that, longer has that, nobody has that. the same kind of technology. Forty programmers, software people are working on that, and we'll discuss such things in November. When we have the meeting of self-regulatory organizations, and we'll discuss that in the Central Bank of Russia, and we'll speak about that in every detail, and welcome everybody who is willing to. What do we have today, and what is implemented in reality? I already said that our business is implemented at homes, at households. We have electronic histories, which allows us to assess a person and and what is happening with him. If we take um, a look back at the website, we can discuss the slide. In reality, the business starts in electronic form when the form is filled in. It starts with very simple questions. Such questions as, can you be identified when you are going to your apartment? What kind of gadgets? Do you have at home? Uh, do you have tattoos on your body? Do you have uh, bottles uh, uh, after using the alcohol? Do you have the number of two uh, brushes? And is that enough for your members of uh, the family? But, so these are simple questions, but uh, this helps to identify a person that is really um, a real um, picture of the person, uh, and we learn quite a lot about him. And for that matter, we have a default rate at a very low level, and uh, the product is uh, actually available to such persons when they are identified. The agent takes the decision whether to leave the uh, card, which is 
счет by the partner bank. And um, uh, if he leaves the card, the person with the card goes to the bank and uh, activates that. And uh, uh, the people who uh, are working in the zone of subprime receives uh, uh, the card and may use the money for uh, the urgent needs. If the person is uh, working in uh, Irkutsk and resides in Irkutsk without having electronic gadget, uh, gadgets, uh, he will not be able to resolve quite a lot of issues. Now, how money is uh, using uh, IP on, uh, which is developed by themselves? We have 40, 40 programmers and uh, they maintain the whole system in working condition. Our country is divided in 4,000 uh, zones and the zoning is carried out even better than in the Statistic Committee of the Soviet Union. We know everything about the territories which we manage because our, uh, a lot depends on that and we've got to know how many managers and agents we've got to have and we track the movements of our agents across the territory. The agent is linked to the territory and he does not have the right to live in one uh, part of Moscow uh, and work in the other one. The agent does not have the right to uh, live in one city and work in uh, some other uh, city. He must um, reside and work within the same area. Well, it may take him just 10 uh, minutes to walk to his office. So, and um, uh, uh, this is the business. Uh, the uh, uh, access of the customer to financial sources and the identification of the client actually um, is um, depending on whether the uh, agent knows his client. He must know everything. Doctors, uh, kindergarten, uh, everything which uh, his uh, customer needs for life. So we have a certain uh, organizational nature and we have socialist competition. You may know about that. So you may discuss that. But there are entrepreneurs who are interested in the motivation of their stuff. And they will understand very well what uh, non-material or non-financial incentives mean. When uh, the leader of the group has the red chair instead of a black uh, chair. Well, the red chair is a little bit uh, more expensive, but the girls who are in the office will compete for this uh, chair. So, and we'll, mm, uh, we know that the winner of the competition uh, will be stimulated, he'll get more incentives, and everybody will thank him and his parents or her parents, thank you, mother, for your son or your daughter, etc., etc. Uh, that was a quote from a song. Uh, and uh, we can see all that, and we use that, and we show our partners what we do. So, finally, 33%. Repeatedly, actually, and uh, instead of going to other microfinance institutions, those who follow the press and know what is going on in the sphere know that 15 days ago, uh, a uh, survey was held by the Bureau of Credit History and the company uh, Co Money. Uh, uh, on the mm, histories of the clients, only 25% of uh, customers of microfinance organizations and uh, banks um, cross over. That explains why a person who has a good credit history does not go to the bank. We surveyed 15,000 people who took loans last year. And those who took a loan in a bank, uh, uh, it might be not the client of the bank, uh, 
и показали, что 85% из So uh, I'm advertising all this. I'm advertising um, our services by Kiwi. Thank you, Kiwi. And the very last thing I'd like to say, every agent, when I'm saying that here um, he's linked both to Kiwi and to our system, Every agent has his own possibility to enter the system, and he is linked to the server, and quite a lot of things are reflected in the system. Uh, he has online access, we see feedback, and we see everything in the online regime, what is happening to the agent, and we see all the requests and applications, uh, and uh, how the agent actually uh, launches uh, the request uh, and, and, or the application. Well, well as a matter of fact, that is all with respect to home money. Uh, I'd like to speak about Financio. May I have a little bit more time? Yes, I have two minutes only. Uh, so well, that is the right slide. The company Finadiel. Uh, the idea is we used the software TerraSoft, and uh, it received the recognition of the uh, interbank exchange. But the activity of the company is fully automated, and um, uh, this company serves a small and micro business, not small and medium sized business, but micro business. And uh, who are the consumers? Uh, the consumers are those who do not have uh, access to, bank to banking. So there is, uh, well, uh, the um, uh, car maintenance, um, uh, small and Enterprise, that is a garage uh, or a, some, a small company who are willing to start producing doors. But that is a retail uh, commerce, that is retail trade, and it has no relationship to uh, banking uh, fund, uh, to bank funding. But we're going very fast. Uh, in 10 minutes, uh, the person will know whether he gets the money integrated client management and also um, the point is that I have two minutes I won't manage that is why I stop here thank you very much I'd like to tell you that you launched you made a tactical Mistake. You should have uh, <laughs> given uh, the floor at the very start of the session, uh, and because of that, everybody would uh, have woken up. But so you see that this is the business leader. He will not open up all his cards, but he will invite everybody to uh, the event on the 15th of um, September. Thank you very much, Victor I'm sorry for intervention.
прекрасные презентации. Well, thank you very much. Uh, really not say perfect uh, uh, presentation, but uh, now I have a personal problem because I don't want to repeat uh, or to replicate everything that was said. Uh, maybe I will simply sum up. I heard always and over and over again that the development of the ED sector means uh, hybrid uh, solutions and consolidation. But uh, today uh, we face brand new type of uh, risks uh, because the number of players uh, gets really high and uh, the customer will uh, say uh, the, 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 the client uh, will have problems uh, to identify where is the bottleneck. So if the mobile payment fails, uh, where was this bottleneck? Uh, in uh, the uh, mobile network, uh, in uh, uh, the bank, uh, in the processing system, where? mentioned, uh, what, what was not mentioned here, uh, I would say we spoke about uh, loans, but today we see the trend of merge between uh, loans and payments. Mobile uh, 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 operators uh, so try to experiment with instant mobile uh, uh, loans. Uh, let's say uh, uh, somebody wants to make a payment, but uh, money on the account is uh, not enough, and in this case that the mobile operator may instantly grant uh, the missing amount. No, this is just on the, the let's say, conception point of view. It's not yet have been clearly thought uh, about. Anti-money laundering. Uh, Надо сказать, что we also spoke about uh, say, different security issues. Uh, IML, counter-terrorism. It's really uh, true that phones give more opportunities, more options uh, to monitor uh, IML uh, requirements. At the last meeting, FATS said uh, that um, it's going to move from uh, the um, system, uh, say, simple we'll say, monitoring into verifying the, uh, the compliance, so to, to check whether the system is available in the country does uh, help to uh, ensure uh, uh, IML. Yeah. Uh, I believe that sooner or later we will all say, uh, understand that phone is better than uh, an uh, ID. Uh, if uh, you just uh, once came to the bank and showed your ID, the bank knows nothing about you. Uh, if you use the phone, uh, we always have the, say, the data to, to monitor, to trace where have you been uh, and when uh, did you make a, a payment. Uh, there are a lot of things that just to be done. Uh, you need to, to uh, allow let's say, the delegation of identification to the uh, agents. I fully agree with uh, our uh, speakers that uh, we need uh, say, to discuss it with our regulators because neither business nor technology is now setting up uh, barriers. So the technologies are on uh, the uh, up uh, rise, but uh, the regulation lags behind and we need uh, to balance them. Uh, we also need to, to think, or I'll say, to change our attitude to financial education. Uh, contemporary technologies are developing so fast uh, that uh, neither uh, education nor regulators uh, uh, keep the pace up uh, with them. Uh, if we use, let's say, the conservative trend first, let's say, writing uh, uh, textbooks or developing uh, uh, courses, uh, we will never manage to keep up with the technologies. Uh, we should think about uh, say, on the spot, online uh, 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 education. So as soon as the product or technology is there, uh, we should immediately tell the customer about pluses and minuses. And it would be great if such knowledge would be inherent to a product or a technology. 
мероприятия, у нас там запланировано подведение итогов. Сейчас я хотел бы, коллеги, спросить, если есть вопросы. Так как мой вопрос вспоминают до сих пор, oh, я задам uh, еще один, чтобы его вспоминали uh, до вечера. My uh, morning uh -huh. question uh, Сынок, is управление uh, рисками, now, когда so мобильный оператор uh, оказывает финансовые again. услуги. Регулирование This is confusing. Uh, most of the countries where these services have been, have been allowed is that uh, the regulators are drafting and uh, approving uh, e-money regulations, let's say, uh, where they establish the opportunity for non-banks and banks to provide, to provide this type of services, transfers and payments on the same rules, with the same use of the agents for cash outs, with the same KYC uh, procedures, with the difference then if a bank uh, wants to do it, just need to receive an authorization under its uh, traditional business model, uh, maybe showing also a business plan or a contingency plan for the specific service and product. And when uh, Bank, a non-bank uh, can be an operator or another third party uh, wants to do the business needs to set up a separate entity which is then licensed by the central bank so the supervision and the regulation and the monitoring is completed the, is separated between the two institutions and you see uh, this is a financially regulated and supervised institution. Um, in terms of capital adequacy, uh, the mobile money providers have a 100% capital adequacy requirements. So it's a much safer uh, business than the banking business. Because every single penny or a ruble that enters in the system is reflected and mirrored in the bank account where this money is pooled. And mobile money providers cannot do intermediation. And that's where the big difference in terms of business and risk stay with the banking sector. Uh, mobile money providers do only transfers, payments, facilitation of uh, G2P, Uh, or uh, of uh, other bulk payments, but they don't intermediate the money. The money is in a pooled uh, account, so it's uh, quite a different and safer uh, business. Oh, Selma, does it mean that you get the license in every yes, country? Yes, we receive a license da. in every country. Da. Yes, da. and in every country we set up, we usually set up a separate company directly licensed. And maybe I also I, I missed out not mentioning it before that M-Pesa is an entirely prepaid system. So whatever uh, you know sent in the electronic value is entering the system. It's backed by the actual cash on a bank account on a trust account having been a, having been a bank regulator I think that's a very very important question let me tr try to tackle it yes why do we regulate banks the first question which we look at is that they are deposit takers banks are a deposit takers 
and uh, the money they use for their business belongs to the customer. So banks worldwide are regulated as banks by a central bank or another authority. When a telco or an MNO wants to do anything in the area of financial, the first thing you have to do is to realize that they don't know the risks associated with the deposit taking. So the first thing we did was to require that deposit taking is not an aspect for MNOs. They do not take deposits. That's the reason why we created a trust account. The purpose for a trust account is to separate the money from the telco, so the money which is collected by the MNOs is placed in a trust account and is legally protected, ring-fenced, to the point where even if an MNO collapsed, that money is secure. That's what Simone was belaboring. So for those who are allowing mobile providers, telco providers, the first thing you have to address is the issue of deposit taking. And that's, you have to separate it. Now, the license for the MNO is given by the telco regulator. And that license, the issue of payment services is value, value addition. So value addition, in our case in Kenya, we don't call it a license. We call it authorization. Should that entity have problems with the licensor of their course, they will not be able to offer payment services. So we only authorize them to obey the rules of the telco, but to be authorized to do payments on condition that they are meeting the requirements of the telco. And finally, it is only recently we created a new term of institutions we call payment service providers. So payment service providers are not the same as banks. They can be banks, but they can be many, many other institutions, including the ones which are being described here. And for that reason, the issue of capital does not really arise. Why? The telco has invested heavily in its infrastructure. And even if it were to collapse, that infrastructure will still be in the country. So when, when in the banking system, we always talk about the capital, in the payments, that is not a very important parameter because the infrastructure cost that a telco has invested is so heavy. In that case, the capital is not really as important as in the banking sector. So I have said the three things. Deposit taking is what one of the issues you have to address. The second one is a value addition. And the third one is that capital is not really important in the area of payment service providers. What you want for them is to have a robust system that can do all the other things and mitigate all the risks. And I may want to add there that the reason why you saw me limiting how much they can do, and this is the fear I have, is so that you are able to learn up to a point, like today, we can allow M-Pesa to do more because they have already been culturalized into doing more. So we will grow them accordingly. Thank you. Спасибо большое, Алмия Сатен, за прекрасный вопрос. И спасибо всем, спасибо всем спикерам за замечательные ответы. Ну, я хотел бы сейчас перекинуть мостик к нашей завершающей встрече. Но эта зона, эта тема пока находится в такой не до конца урегулированной с нашей точки зрения зоне, понимая ее перспективность и нужность, мы, тем не менее, несколько раз за сегодняшний день озвучивали регуляторные вызовы, озвучивали вопросы технологического характера, озвучивали аспекты рисков, и в рамках нашей завершающей дискуссии мы планируем сегодня обсудить такую тему, как перспективы, возможности и ограничения, связанные с развитием сегмента онлайн-кредитов. 
создавать в России как возможно первый сегмент после платежного, в котором будут реализованы механизмы цифровых финансовых услуг. Поэтому сейчас я объявляю перерыв на короткий кофе-брейк, и в 16 часов мы продолжим работу. Спасибо. Я объявляю маленький кофе-брейк, и мы продолжим в 4.